In a world that is really upside down, the true is a moment of the false. Starting like that feels kind of rote. You know, the sort of vague quotation at the beginning that doesn't really add any interest that wasn't already there, but gives a veneer of credibility because of its obscurity. In any case, you and I are doing spectacle right now. You'll likely see a few ads about Jesus. Spectacle. 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 Okay, the spectacle is a neo-Marxist concept. Take the green pill and become an Eagles fan. Spooky. The spectacle is a consensual hallucination, like a waking dream. And there are about five different definitions of it in this book and five more in the second one. But let's start with this one. The spectacle is not a collection of images. It's a social relation between people that is mediated by images. That means us. Our relationship is currently mediated by images and I am performing as a spectacular object. And I'm sure you've noticed, like Debord did in 1967, that images have taken up more and more of the world. Right now you're consuming 30 frames per second. So what does this have to do with Marxism? Whoa. It's actually an update to Marx. Neo. For Marx, commodities mediate social relationships in a capitalist system. The C is for commodity. And it's the first line of capital. And most importantly to you, whether or not you care for Marxism, you are commodified by your ability to work. You put your labor on the market as a commodity you sell, which mediates your relationship to everybody. Your employer now owns a large percentage of your time. Your colleagues are now direct competitors while everyone else in the market is sort of an indirect competitor and how much their labor is valued also determines what yours is worth. That's our system. Now, just in case you're not Marxist or in, it freaks you out a little bit or whatever, even though that's a Marx quotation, there's nothing uniquely Marxist about anything I've said yet. For capitalist economics, that's just called the labor market, you know, supply, demand, and we're still running with that today. And now the kicker, none of that situation has actually changed. And the commodity relationship still belongs to what De Boer refers to as reality. Reality is who owns what, who can afford what, and that's what really matters. But reality has disappeared. Not disappeared as in it doesn't exist anymore. Re <laughs> reality's still there. It's just that it's not polite to ask questions about it, okay? The spectacle is a super reality or a tumor reality that's taken over the host. When social relations are all mediated by images and noise, reality gets drowned out and the spectacle becomes our consciousness. And it's full of stuff that doesn't matter, like the fresh new products that you don't need or gossip over which celebrities are bad people and all those other attention fads. Even when reality is brought up at all, you can't really pay attention to it because it's mixed in the same morass on the same screen as everything else. Okay, mute. Mute! God damn. Remember that first line of Marx's Capital? Well, Guy Debord gives it an update in his first line. In societies where modern conditions of production prevail, life is presented as an immense accumulation of spectacles. Interestingly, he opts not to say capitalist modes of production, it's changed to modern conditions of production, in which life is presented as an immense accumulation of spectacles. Why do we need all these conspiracy theories lately, huh? <laughs> Maybe because this one is just so obvious that it's too boring. Okay. Each spectacle is connected to every other spectacle. So let's map it. We'll start with a show about advertising or a show about advertising's corporate owners. Then we can take guys from these shows about advertising and put them on magazines or in ads for other products. These were from the Super Bowl, a celebrity event, all the celebs. 
Then the Super Bowl is covered by news networks. And, oh, wait, what? Oh my God, what the f is this? Oh man, I gotta say, that's incredible. That's not an accident. And you know who would have gotten a real kick out of this? Real heads know. One fantasy world leaks into the next. Anyway, back to the cork board, we're not done. Because in addition to doing literal ads, the news shows also watch Super Bowl ads for new films produced by their bosses. Then the same news shows cover politics in a political system that includes the aforementioned football players and musicians or actors from shows. Full circle. Next, one more level. News commentators cover the news coverage about actors and football players in politics and Satanist singers also. Then the news commentators also commentate on each other because of a video game based on a movie based on a book. This is a really layered image. There's no depth though, they're all flat layers. It is a streamer talking about a YouTuber, talking about that streamer, talking about a video game that is based on a movie that is based on a book. And then finally, a YouTuber tirelessly edits all this into a video about it so that he can pitch you on a Patreon subscription, starting at the low, low price of $4 a month to get weekly content, link in the description. This is the spectacle familiar images. Now underneath the spectacle is the reality that the spectacle conceals. Everything going into this has at least the tacit consent of the powers actually running this shit show. We think of celebrities as the rich and powerful, which is usually wrong. Even they are way closer to us than to actual power. This network constitutes De Boer's reality, true production. Who owns what and seduces all the attention from the rest of it. Down here, you have the power to, let's see, uh, overthrow governments, to handpick politicians or entire parties, those which write the laws they follow and we follow. Ultimately, they construct the world that the rest of us just live in, contentedly unconscious and talking about this all day. Dude. Democracy is the most successful total bullshit mythology ever. And it's still just getting endless mileage. Everything you choose to do in here, and the difference between 1967 and now is that you also get to immediately participate in it by spectacularizing yourself. You get to be an image too, a profile, with all the little signals and vocabulary and symbols to be part of the image debate of the day. You know, right, left, lib, anti-lib, woke, anti-woke. These are all illusory decisions. Ugh. We've now moved from the conspicuous consumption of commodities to the conspicuous consumption of images, images that make identities. And there's no difference between choosing your image and choosing which sports team you're going for or which brands of bread to buy. I actually wasn't allowed to eat white bread growing up. I don't even know what this tastes like. Here we go. Kind of pasty, no? Conquest. All the real decisions occur over here, power. Whereas everything you watch and criticize and moralize is wholly separate from that. Here's a, here's a new one. These class war films are kind of having a moment lately, but they aren't anti-capitalist and neither is talking about them. They're images, consumer identity choices with the same efficacy as which bread brand you buy. Kind of pasty, no? But none of that ever represents reality and the actual power is still here, just like it always has been with who owns what? Yes, shh, I know it's bad manners for a post-structuralist to talk about reality, but I'll come back to it later. In the spectacle, everything's a choice and none of the choices matter. <laughs> which movie, which party, which team, which celebrity, which commentator, both sides of every decision need the other in order to present the illusion of choice itself. But the act of consuming is always identical.
So Hassan Piker talks about Ben Shapiro so that Ben Shapiro can talk about Hassan Piker, about the weighty ethical decision about whether to play a Harry Potter video game or not. And since image consumption is always put into weighty ethical terms because we have nothing else to put in weighty ethical terms, people believe that it is an ethical decision. But the ends, the consequences are all the same. Before any talking object on a screen has said anything at all. And that end is unconsciousness. More specifically, the inability to believe that anything will ever change for your benefit. And that's the purpose of the spectacle. And the consensual part of the collective hallucination is that you've agreed to it. You agreed to watch this video. This video is spectacular. And sorry, but talking about reality, even this reality is not reality. It's exchanging images about reality. Where's that sad music? So yeah, at first, the spectacle is a giant outgrowth of capitalism. And you might think, well, let's just do revolution and get rid of this. But no one seems ever to remember this part of the book. The spectacle is the order of the day in communist states also. So this is a 1967 book, but he says both the USSR and CCP utilize, no, need to utilize spectacles too. It's just the images of those systems are centralized rather than diffuse. This imagery also conceals the real relationship of who actually owns what in a communist state, which De Boer says has just declined into bureaucratic capitalism. So all modern conditions of production run on spectacles. You might wonder what kind of Marxist is a critic of the USSR and CCP and the Communist Party in his own country. Well, let's just, he's one who's not great at parties. Now, you know, probably the spectacle very well because you live in it every day and carry it in your pocket. I don't need to explain any of that, but you may appropriately be asking, what is the big deal? Why now? No culture's never not had an imaginary. There's been art, architecture, theater for a long time. But the big deal with it is, and the reason this book came out when it did, is the TV. Before the TV, these imaginary experiences were almost always public. They created crowds as a corollary to them. And with the TV and its descendants, there's no longer a social crowd corresponding to the images. It's rather a lonely crowd, a crowd of individuals, a crowd from which the social has disappeared. And all of the spectacle's new technologies, TVs, cars, suburbs, phones, Uber Eats, they all isolate under the value heading of convenience. It's convenient because you can spend more time consuming if you don't have to wait up for anyone else. And so we don't. We consume as individuals alongside other individuals. The product of our system, more than any other in history, is that it destroys the social, which protects reality from change. Being in the spectacle is like, everyone's got their own Iron Man suit, but it's not a protective suit. Rather, it's a private iron prison. You only get to see everything through a little digital screen, which evaluates images as commodities for you. You touch only through metal. There's a disembodied algorithmic voice guiding all your decisions. At your service, sir. And of course, the suit's funded by a defense contractor. Your private, individual, expensive, CGI-generated prison. Later on with Iron Man, and true to form, this is actually profound. It doesn't even matter if there's a person inside the suit because an AI manages the whole thing. Oh, I'm not here. Your cage, your image, doesn't even need you to go on functioning in the exchange system. So how's that for an image of the times? What Max Weber called the steel shell or iron cage of capitalism, it's the Iron Man suit. For de Boer, the one thing that can combat the spectacle is concrete sociality. So self-help and psychotherapy, that's where you go when you've got a problem. All the fixes though are individual fixes. You can do this, 
put your mind to it, go work on yourself. But what if the problem is social in origin? It wouldn't be something that you can fix by working on yourself in isolation. And the spectacle's isolation is itself the problem, which is why de Boer writes so often about public spaces like city design, for example, making cities places that welcome humans rather than cars. Because these days, humans in cities feel kind of like they're in the way just by even being outside. Or public art, vandalizing even, sabotaging the symbols of capitalism that dominate the public space. And protesting, protesting anything, do it. Because all of these compel interactions with other people that are not already captured in the endless cycle of production and consumption. Like almost all the time that you see other people regularly, it's at work or shopping, sometimes an event, but rarely spontaneously. Never just because you went for a wander. Derive. That spontaneity and that just because could create the new unforeseen situations that mitigate alienation and the spectacle. Because without a connection to other people that goes beyond commodities and images, you're on your own, alone in a crowd. Funny aside here, but according to de Boer, isolation almost ruined Marx too, by the way. De Boer claims that Marx almost ruined Marxism by having to defend it and getting overly academic, cloistered up in the British Museum. So his later conclusions, so-called scientific Marxism, became obstacles to real Marxism because he wrote about socialism while being isolated from the social. <laughs> Bit of a wild suggestion there, but you know, but maybe. De Boer in general is just really hostile to intellectualizing and debating and specializing theoretical positions to the point that you leave the people behind, as let's be honest, a lot of Marxists do. In hindsight, at least, this book's maybe a bit optimistic on what public art or the organic intellectual can actually get done. But notably for de Boer and the situationists, his crew, changes to the world, revolutionary changes, do not start with economics. And he fought a lot of other leftists on this point. The first change to be sought is not economic. The first change has to be that of public consciousness, class consciousness, getting out of the Iron Man cage. And that would mean content, art, spontaneous discourse outside of the approved channels. It would mean urban planning, spontaneous protest, and intentionally building relationships in order to rebuild the social in public space. The public has to wake up to its social alienation before it's gonna get off its ass and worry about economic alienation. Everyone in the last couple months is running around wondering if AI is gonna be conscious soon, and de Boer's back there wondering if we are ever gonna be conscious. Because freedom must include freedom of the imagination. It has to start with imagination. And we don't really imagine very much at all. We just see through a screen in an iron suit. So consciousness, on the other hand, is supposed to unify the world. The spectacle breaks up the world. It gets you focused on details, gets you privately addicted, gets you in your own head and your own space consuming the content that you chose to. And living like that is like living inside a tumor inside capitalism. And all your energy is wasted on a perpetual present of today's headlines, today's scandals, who just said the latest craziest thing just now, react quickly because the next thing is always incoming. You're a parasite of the spectacle and it's a parasite of you, sucking all your energies into this extraneous stuff. Video games, commentary on commentary, watching news about the news, which is the spectacle reproducing itself. Now, funny enough, the year after this book was published, Guy Debord got pretty much as close to he could as a revolution in the public space that he could have hoped for in Paris 68. I made a whole video on that too, because the CIA was watching carefully and they eventually decided that radical theory wasn't a real threat, just a spectacular one. Anyway, if you're looking for something to watch next, 
eat your spectacle, and on to the next. And last thing, gotta thank all of these people for producing these videos with me. Even though it's spectacular, I hope it's some food for thought. If nothing else, maybe it's a reason to head outside or a way to diagnose the problems and why what we're trying to do never seems to work. Cycle, cycle, spectacle. Obscenity begins when there is no more spectacle. <laughs>